anyhow, on that note, um, I would like to go ahead and introduce Ray Willard with the Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, he's going to be speaking to the Washington State Department of Transportation's Integrated Vegeta Vegetation Management. Welcome, Ray. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm, uh, I talked to you a little bit yesterday, but today I am wearing my WashDOT hat, literally. You see the camo helps me blend in with my cubicle backdrop here. So I uh, thought you guys might like that. Anyway, um, I'm back. And for those of you guys who didn't uh, see me yesterday, I am the Roadside Maintenance Program Manager for the Wash Washington State DOT. And I've been doing this for a while. In fact, I've been with uh, DOT my whole career. I started in 1985. So I'm getting close to the end here. But it's been great. And um, I've been able to work on Scotch Broom for quite a few years now. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about um, what we got going here. I'm going to move my webcam out of the way. And uh, what I'm going to really talk to you about today, and I, if anybody has seen my presentation before, um, this last year I was able to give this to quite a few people, or at least a form of this presentation. And it's really about the asset management system that we are putting together here at WashDOT that is going to hopefully save our roadsides for the future. So I'll talk about that, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the actions that we've taken that have been successful in places. And then I'll give you some roadsides at the end that you can help me keep an eye on in the coming years as we work on those roadsides. And uh, you can help me monitor the Scotch Broom. So with that, um, everybody, I get this every year, right? Um, basically, advance my slide, here we go. I get this question every year. Uh, get a lot of calls every spring about Scotch fruit. And uh, we have a lot of concerns about the smell. A lot of people don't like the smell. Um, everybody wonders why there's so much and why we're not doing anything about it. Hence the title of my talk. But this is a quote. I went ahead and called once again, just to refresh my memory. The guy who hired me for this job, Bob Berger. And Bob is uh, one of the, the old school landscape architects that uh, served well for uh, what 25 years there in the same role that I have now. And uh, according to Bob, Washdot never intentionally planted the invasive form of Scotch broom, that is the straight variety of Statistis coparius. However, in conjunction with highway construction in the 1950s, we did work together, and at least our uh, roadside maintenance engineer at the time um, worked with the UW to develop some sterile varieties of this plant. So whether that's a good idea or not, we don't know, but the plants that we did develop and plant out there didn't seem to spread at all. We never saw any seed spread. So there you go, the bottom slide, you can see this is a, this is on Martin Way heading up towards um, Lacey here in Olympia. Um, this is another broom, variety of broom that we did plant. This is a cross, I think it's a cross hybrid between Scoparius and another variety, but they call it cuensis. And so this is another non-seed producing variety and you'll see some remnants of these. Uh, there was a lot of these up in Everett. Um, they were planted throughout Federal A area on I-5 and uh, this one in Olympia was just sort of a leftover that popped up when we redid the landscape here. But you look around, you drive around, <laughs> this time of year especially, it's really obvious that Scotch broom loves Washington roads. Right. So why is that? I mean, everybody's got to have a habitat, right? And I talked yesterday about Earth being our habitat, right? So I wanted to just remind you, uh, photo credit on this one goes to Neil Armstrong, but this is our habitat, guys. This is all we got. And the jobs that we're doing right now, working on the land and helping to manage the land, those are some of the most important jobs terms of this place, right? We all know that. But everybody's got to have a habitat and um, to build habitats, humans try to create these impenetrable structures and keep nature completely out. And that's fine and it works for a while, but in the end, nature will always win because nature abhors a vacuum. And like I talked about yesterday, trying to guess where the earth is at in its life cycle and uh, kind of talking to a bunch of people, we're thinking maybe early thirties, she might be you know, even younger than that. But the thing is, in her early 30s, 
she has, you know, think about all the time that um, the earth has supported life. And you think about all the species that have existed, right? And here we are now, and just really in the last blink of time for the earth, maybe in the last minute or even less than a minute, the earth has developed this kind of a rash, right? <laughs> it's, it's homo sapiens and we are spreading around and building stuff. And so kind of the point I was trying to make yesterday was when we build sites, when we develop sites so that we can have a habitat and make it safe from the, all the dangers in nature, we um, basically need to do that in a way that is either, it's not so much a scab on the earth as it is a tattoo or maybe even better yet, a piece of jewelry, right? It sits lightly and it looks good. But that's kind of where we're at. And as a landscape architect, that's why I'm here. I love my job. I love talking to people about their sites and how to manage them. And uh, I think, uh, you know, it's a gardener's thing, right? But it's also it's just something some of us are born with, I think. And it's a passion for stewardship. And uh, some people have it and some people don't. But the people that have it, we got to capitalize on them and, and recruit them. But let me just talk now about the, the site that I've been working on for the past 30 years. So this is really where, where the magic is happening for us right now, at least in terms of any hope of us getting money to do roadside restoration in the future. Because just driving around, you can see what's going on, at least in Washington state. And it's, it's interesting that some of the other states like Oregon and California really are still at a higher level of maintenance on their roadside than Washington is. And uh, I'll go into that a little bit, but first I wanna kind of go over this poster that we created to explain why we're trying to do this system. And so basically it's 100,000 acres of land, right? And it's stretched across the whole state. Real linear landscapes, um, very, you know, any kind of corridor management, whether it's power lines, rail lines, highways, it's gonna be um, this kind of a setup where you have the operational roadway or right of way that has to be maintained in a kind of a set condition. With a highway, it has to be paved. And, and then from there out, you have to have zones that will address the safety of traffic and then blend from the highway into the surrounding environment. If we're in cities, um, then we're looking at trying to develop that into a usable space. And uh, there's a bunch of challenges with this. And you'll see that in terms of even people trying to live and set up camp in these places. Anyway, so the, we also have a lot of effort going into mitigation. This is coming out of our project side of the house. And we also have a set of acres that was purchased during highway expansion with the intention of preservation. So it's basically intended to be locked up in perpetuity as a uh, natural asset. Anyway, uh, we've got cost data on this. And uh, really what we're looking at is mapping this out statewide and then using that map to record all the data in terms of actions and results that goes along with these various types of landscapes that we're trying to manage. So any site, you could take it and break it down like this, but when it comes to corridors, this is kind of what we're looking at in terms of transportation at WashDOT. And what we you're using this for is to create a geographic inventory of six specific roadside land use types shown here, and then to provide, use that as a basis for how we budget, plan, track, monitor, evaluate, it's basically a systematic way of doing that. And the magic really happens on the iPads. And we've been able to get iPads for all our guys. Um, it's working really well. They're able to view maps in the field and keep records in the field. Those records are all stored straight away on the map. And at the end of the day, when they download their data back at the office, that data becomes part of our database. And we have literally millions and millions of records now after operating this system now for just the last three years. Anyway, let's go take a step back here and think about, so basically the site can have boundaries and you can scale those boundaries, right? We can talk about one site being Washington State and you've got boundaries there and you basically have, um, you know, if you break it down to its raw basic elements, what Lewis and Clark would have seen when they got here, and that's the image I have up here. This is an image from the cover of Stephen Ambrose's book called Un Undaunted Courage. And uh, that's just a great book. I totally recommend that. And I meant to, I'm gonna just do a little sidebar here for a sec. This is another book I meant to mention yesterday, but I would commend this book to everybody. It's called The Overstory. 
It's Richard Powers. This is he's written quite a few other books. I'm going to read some of his other stuff too. But this is quite possibly the best book. I, maybe I shouldn't say that. I don't know. It's really good, and I just finished it. It's super timely. It has a lot to do with. I mean, it's basically about social and environmental justice. Right there, you go. So read it. Uh, basically, though, back to my talk. We got Washington State right in its raw form. Here you go. This is where we, this is our, what we have to work with. This is our plot of land, right? Oregon, you got yours. California's got theirs. But for now, we're going to draw the boundaries here. Within this realm, we can now start to manage things as a state, right? State government and then county governments within that all working together um, with the public and the private landowners and really trying to make this place the best we can make it, right? But really, when you break it down to it, this is what we're working with. You've got the geographic boundaries, and then you've got your geology, the soils and the rocks and all the stuff that makes the land. Then you've got the water systems. Then you've got all of your biological systems, creatures and plants. And then laying over the top of that is climate, right? And we all know there's something going on with the climate, right? Anyway, trying to do what we're doing, and that is, create sustainable human civilization here in Washington, right? We want to be able to go into the future so that um, this place stays, you know, it's got this magic place, right? We want to keep that magic. So how do you do that? That's really what we're talking about here. And when it comes to landscape architecture, that's what we're trying to do, at least we should be. Now, a lot of landscape architects, you know, you might see them going off in little, little tangents and getting kind of sucked into really fancy, landscapes like golf courses and urban plazas and things like that but when it really comes down to it the real work of a landscape architect is to try and ensure that we have a landscape in the future so design sustainable systems that can be maintained over time without causing undue burden to society and we call that a state of good repair so how do you define a state of good repair right and that's kind of what we were able to do in our asset management plan is we were able to say here's what we're talking about and it goes back to that poster that I had but really what you've got is three very distinct management strategies in terms of the land right and so I, this is all my stuff guys I, I really haven't this is sort of distilled from things I've read and done but this is kind of a just my take on it so I just want you to know that but this term agronomic strategy I don't know if that's Right, but basically what we're talking about is if it's gonna be a structure or something that you want to sustain as long as possible in a state of good repair without having to replace it, that's one management strategy. That's paint, that's change the oil, you know, whatever. So when you get into the agronomic strategy, that's when you're talking about landscapes that you wanna manage for a purpose such as, could be uh, you know, agriculture, could be forestry, could be, uh, turf and ornamental, golf course, whatever, right? So those have their own set and their own necessary strategies. But then you have the natural landscape and in managing that and trying to replicate that and help it out, that's an ecological strategy. That's working with nature year by year using this cycle to try and get it dialed in. So this is what we've been doing at WashDOT. And this is basically what I've been working on um, since I started working in maintenance trying to get this going and make sure that we touch every spot, every highway in the state every year and kind of look at what happened there and then talk about what should we do in the future as far as maintenance action to keep it going in a sustainable direction. So this process goes on and on. And ideally this is kind of what happens is this edge. And that's really what we're talking about with corridor landscapes is trying to do the best job you can with this edge, maintain it in a way that softens it, but also, you know, is as maintenance friendly as possible. And that's the real challenge because this is a decades long process, looking at 30 years. And then from 30 years on, you wanna try and keep it in a, this kind of a configuration. Anyway, really hard to do if you don't have a system to capture data year to year and look at it decades later. And we're just starting that system. But going back really quick, if you haven't seen my presentations before, just so you know, WashDOT has done a lot of work on this. And I've had the privilege to be the one to help 
kind of pull things together, but this was back in 1993, we published this, my first project with the agency. We looked at options for how to manage the roadside in terms of chemical, mechanical, or do nothing. And uh, came out with our preferred alternative, which was to develop integrated vegetation management plans and roll with them year by year, like we like we saw in the, in the diagram. Federal Highways has also been very instrumental in helping with this and encouraging the states to do a better job managing the roadsides naturally. This book is uh, something I commend to all of our DOT managers. It's um, back 2013, I think, is when it came out. But that map I showed of the eco regions of our state, what they've done is they've mapped eco regions across the whole country and also included which agencies deal with them in that state and how to how the state sort of um, are arranged in terms of dealing with their um, natural systems. Really cool. Uh, we've done a lot of work policy-wise with WashDOT. Um, we've got this book written recently, uh, working with National Research Committee. I also have the honor of working, serving as part of a, a National Research Committee on roadsides. And this book was a product of um, uh, some researchers funded through um, federal funds. And uh, what we've got here in Washington are these roadside vegetation management plans. We've developed these starting in the right around 2000 five or so is when we first started publishing these annually. Um, but our, our goal is to publish each area plan each year. And these are the 24 area plans and actually two of our regions now, Olympic and Southwest region, have combined their area plans into a region. So like I said, the site, you can scale your site and there's some advantages of having a larger site. There's also some very definite advantages of having a very small site like your own yard. Anyway, here's kind of what we're looking at as far as our strategy. And this is, goes for all weeds, really. But um, what we're looking at is prioritizing the areas that we have in our state that are already in a really good state of repair. If we have a roadside that's in a good state of repair, we don't want to lose them. So that's our first priority. If, you plant, if a plant we don't want shows up there, um, that's where we'll get rid of it first. Then we have a whole series of sites where we are required to control by law, including all of Eastern Washington, pit sites in, in uh, some of the counties, and only on the corridor. Some counties only require control of some weeds like Scotch Room on the corridors. So the other sites that would be uh, areas that we have recently worked on in terms of um, construction, we want to make sure those stay in good condition, but we typically try to leave that to the projects and get um, plant establishment through project dollars rather than maintenance. And then the rest of it is kind of where, um, uh, well, we, we have a lot of areas that we're just gonna let it grow until we have resources or reason to go in there and, and do a major restoration project. And when you're talking restoration, Scott, we're really talking decades. All right, so I think I'm doing okay on time. What you got here, so. You, I don't have my clock yet, so maybe you could give me a heads up, maybe better like uh, when I'm halfway. Did you do that, Mary? Anyway. Yeah, this is Mary. It's uh, 11.33 now. Okay, and I'm going to when? Uh, 11.50. Okay, good. Okay, so let me just give you guys some places because I assume at some point we're gonna get back out and start driving around again. But when you're doing that, I wanted everyone to kind of join me in helping monitor these roadsides. And there's one thing that when I first started with DOT, I mentioned this yesterday that I lived in Ballard, we just bought a house and I commuted to Olympia for five years on I-5. So that was my first real like getting mad at Scotch Broom experience during that commute. I just could not believe how much the broom was expanding as I was driving year to year to Olympia. So I want you guys to kind of help me out here. These are some spots that we are gonna be working on in the years ahead to try and restore these areas to a state of good repair in all three zones. So what you'd expect to see, and this is this is actually where we would have been, guys. This is this is Grand Mound, and if you keep going down here, you take the next exit, and you're uh, you're at the Great Wolf Lot, right? That's where we would have been. And they have water slides. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, talk about a place to get sick. Anyway, never. <laughs> I didn't say that. All right. So anyway, this is Scatter Creek area. This is where the Mima Mounds are. This is South Puget Sound Prairie, kind of at its best, and uh, we've got. The rest area right there, Scatter Creek rest area is right there. 
and we have a, a, a research plot that we've installed and have been working on for the last few years. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but this is just a really interesting area. And I, I, this is kind of when I saw the presentations yesterday, um, Rod and Nathan and fire and stuff. I mean, we can't really use fire on the roadside. So we are using other methods, but this is a challenging area. I mean, look at this. If you go beyond the roadside throughout this area, any of the cleared fields are scotch broom usually. They, the seeds are there, and if you don't do something, it's gonna grow. But it's a really challenging area, and um, but that's something that we are gonna be working on in the, in the years ahead. And, and we've actually um, committed to, uh, right now, we're at year 12, I'm thinking, in terms of uh, how much we've actually concerted effort to keep the broom from going to seed. And there's a lot of uh, snowberry, uh, spirea, there's other, there's some really great natives in there that we want to encourage, amelanchier, um, there's a lot of uh, Oregon grape. So we're trying to encourage those stands to go because those are great for pollinators as well as the native forbs. But really when it comes to it and you get a roadside like this, so this is the rest of the things I want you to guys, as you're going south now on I-5, or if you're from Oregon, you're coming up north, the whole stretch between Vancouver and Olympia on I-5 is a pretty good, I mean, that's as good as we have in terms of Western Washington freeway road sides. And you'll see a lot of it looks like this. We haven't touched it for years now. In fact, in 2015, our agency embarked on a reduced mowing policy in the name of pollinators. And we did that so that you could have these kinds of road sides. And just because if you go in and take this out, you're gonna take out a whole bunch of forage for pollinators and probably some uh, pollinators that are nesting there, you know, whatever. Basically though, if you reset it to this, and this is what we did here is an example. So what I want you to watch for driving south on I-5 between Vancouver and Olympia is the areas where we are going to be case by case, site by site, doing this process. So basically I'll talk about this, but we reset the site to a grass stand with a series of spray mow combinations and get it to where the seed bank is pretty null and we can just have a grass stand there, right? Nothing really grows there until seeds come back in. And, and that process is something we'd like to do with restoration. But right now, reset it to a grass stand and then don't mow it. Let it, let it be like that. If you're gonna mow it, we're gonna just mow this edge, right? I've got pictures of these types of stands where you've got teasel, tansy, blackberries, scotch broom, and there's all kinds of pollinator activity in there. We've also set up transects on these sites and our biologists in the environmental office are measuring pollinator presence on a regular basis. So we'll have all that data um, as we move forward as well. Anyway, just watch for those. Here's another spot you can watch if you're driving up north. This is, uh, where, well, north on the other side of the sound. So this is the 101, 104 interchange just south of Port Townsend. And uh, this is a place where you come out of the trees, you've been driving through trees um, the whole way um, up the canal or coming over from um, the canal. And all of a sudden it opens up and this is a, a really old scotch broom stand we've been working on forever. We mowed it last year again with the brown brush monitor. I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, we'll see how it goes. I-90, this has been a, a huge challenge for us and basically it's, it's kind of a mess still. But this stretch has been mowed periodically over the years. We just haven't been able to follow through with another series of um, actions. And as a result, it tends to grow back. This is just the year after that was mowed a few years ago. And if you drive this now today, um, it's, I think it's two years later this summer, you're gonna see major blackberry scotch broom, all the usual suspects. And going up the passaways too. Um, this area this is an example of what you won't see anything happen to for, I don't know how long. This is South Center Hill. This is I-5 right there, coming um, just past South Center, the 405 interchange past SeaTac. This is actually where I grew up. So my mom's place is actually just down the way here from this. But I get to watch this all the time. And butterfly bush, that's the other one. We could probably talk about a butterfly bush conference here at some point. This plant is going crazy and it loves our right of ways as well. So blackberry though, I would say blackberry is worse than Scotchman in terms of most of Western Washington. A lot of the drier sites and the wooded sites, you don't have as much blackberry, but when it gets there, this plant grows way faster and it spreads by seed by birds like crazy. And this is this is our nemesis. This would probably be my worst weed in Washington. 
but scotch broom, right? This is an Esqually cut coming up the hill here. And you'll see places like this. This would be another example where we're not gonna be able to do much with this until we get some resources. And I would love to be able to do this. In, part, in fact, the Department of Agriculture took out and adopt a highway agreement at one point, and they were gonna clear this hill for us. And they had five volunteers, right? Really good intentions. Anyway, it didn't last. Um, we're still fighting it. But interesting enough, this is 2006, I think. Um, and this picture, you've seen it other places, I'm sure, but this was in the blog that we wrote. But um, this is that same site, just a couple, this, I think this is a year before last. And it's really interesting what's happened with the broom in these south facing slopes where we had really dry, hot summers, it died back and really significantly. Uh, so you guys can help me figure that one out too. Here's another pot. This is going back to 2006 again, but this was after fire regrowth. So you can see the fire came through here. Didn't hit this, but you can see the fire line they created here. Anyway, fire, I think the, the key to scotch broom control is being able to flush the seed. And then once those seeds are flushed, make sure they don't go to seed before you kill them, right? That would be the way to get rid of scotch. The only way that I see. And as we learned in the last couple of days, that's a very challenging process. All right, so here's our process. This is kind of just trying to do whatever we can, working over the years to figure this out. Um, but, but basically what we're looking at is, like I said earlier, prioritizing our sites based on each area's resources and how much they can get to commit to. Because once we commit to one of these sites, we want to stick with it for 10 years or more, right? So um, prioritize where we can do those, map them, in our system, create polygons so that we can track all the actions as we go. Um, then in that polygon, we want to reset the community to a grass stand with an initial mowing and concurrent selective herbicide treatments. And then we just monitor that site. And anytime a broom pops out, we try and get it before it goes to seed. So that's pretty simple. This has been um, the best tool that I've seen. And this is, they don't make these anymore. And in fact, um, the, the Subsequent designs for this sort of a spray mow contraption have been, um, well, we haven't found one as good as this yet, but this was the brown brush monitor and we have controlled a ton of scotch room with this. And one of the sites, this is another place for you guys to keep an eye on. This is where we're building that new diamond bird interchange here. Um, Martin Way on I-5, Hawks Prairie. Here's the account, Thurston County landfill over here. So not a whole lot of scotch room here. And we've been working on this. It's been one of the sites since it's right in my backyard. And the guys in Tacoma have been working on this too with me and, and, and Olympia. Um, Cruz there. Uh, we've been able to get most of the scotch broom out of there. This is what it used to look like when I drove to Olympia back in the 90s. And uh, it's, it, was, uh, it was here to stay, right? But we've been able to get it back. And this is kind of what we did. We started, this is 2000, maybe one or two. Um, we were out there with the... Uh, brown brush monitor and cutting back this mature broom. You can see the dye from the spray being uh, laid down. We use milestone with this. So it has soil activity as well as uh, soil seed suppression as well as foliar and stump control. And so there's what it looks like, a little spray deck um, behind the mow deck. Really good design, worked great. These are really solid. And then um, last year, or this is two years ago now, Ed Winkley and I, Ed is the uh, Olympic was the Olympic Region Landscape Architect. Um, we just, as our own, for our own good, went out there and we treated and pulled, sprayed. Basically, we had baby scotch broom like this. We had 450 of them between the corner here going into Lacey, Olympia, and then um, out there where it drops down into the uh, Nisqually. Pretty cool. We're going to keep working on that, but basically, here's kind of what it's looking like, and it's you can see some camas in there and uh, sheep sorrel and a lot of other natives starting to come back and uh, we'll just keep an eye on that with me. This is a really interesting spot. Um, I'm not sure what happened here, but this is in that Scatter Creek area and this is on an adjoining plot. Um, the neighbor, I don't know what they did to release the camas like this, but this was uh, like this for, it did this for like a couple of years and then they haven't done anything with it. And as a result, now it's back to scotch broom. This is just a couple of years ago. And now I, I'm gonna go back and get another shot of it because this year it looks completely different. All right, let me get out of this. I'm gonna leave you um, with a video. 
first of all, I wanted to just mention Scatter Creek one more time. Um, this is uh, some of the plots we have. There's a, there's a piece of land adjoining the rest area there at Scatter Creek. So Scatter Creek rest area is the northbound rest area right there in Grand Mound. Once you come past um, the Great Wolf Lodge and S SR-12, and you will um, look off to the, the area right before the rest area. And there's a big field there that was purchased um, by WashDOT as a pocket gopher remediation site. And it's managed for us by the DNR. You can see the tracks here from them driving around looking for all the broom. Um, let me show you the video. Um, wait, where'd it go? Oh, yeah, here, let me grab it. It's this one, this one, this one. So this is the area next to the rest area. Here's some of our test plots over here. And uh, you can see this was when we were doing a drone demo. In fact, uh, Justin, that's Justin right there. <laughs> All right, so this Scatter Creek and this meadow right here, we have taken the turf out of this meadow, killed it all off, and uh, over a two year process, done weed control on that meadow. This meadow up here we did without herbicides. This one we did with herbicides. And then this strip along the road is also a test set of test plots. And we tried uh, different seed mixes in these plots, but looking at um, regrowth now, I do have a shot from this year, I should have put in here. It's looking really good this summer or this spring. But when you get a chance, um, stop by the rest area there and check on this. Um, if anybody has questions about any of this stuff or uh, you know, wants to talk to me about roadside, I, I love to talk roadside. I love to talk scotch broom and weed control with anybody. So um, I love that we're all in this together and that you guys are, are excited about this stuff. So. Uh, that's really all I have. And I'll look forward to answering questions and, and talking to you some more when we do the Q&A. Thank you, Ray. Away, uh, I, um, I really enjoyed that. And um, let's see here. Yep. And I, I really felt like some of your words um, really were encouraging, seeing those pictures, the before and after. and really helps us to be encouraged that we can do this. We can take care of the scotch broom, broom it's still possible. So I, I would like to, to go ahead. One more oh, thing, I, I, have, I do have another hat here I wanted to share with you guys. I got this, I, this is my bear hat. And when I get a headache, I just put this on. No more headache, it's amazing. Anyway, nice. See you later. <laughs>